NVIDIA, the graphics card company that we all know and only sometimes love, the makers of GCX and RTX cards, didn't always start out as the massive behemoth that they are today. In fact, they kind of started, well, relatively small and almost innovated their way from there. And so in this video, I want to give you an idea of how they started, some of their defining products, some of their controversies, and give you a bit of a, a catch up on everything you need to know about NVIDIA. But first, if you haven't already, consider subscribing for more videos like this one. Now, NVIDIA started a lot more recently than you might think. See, the industrial giants of Intel and AMD, they've been around for over 50 years at this point, but NVIDIA only started in 1993. Now, in 1993, computers kind of look like this, not exactly a spitting image of today's modern systems, and potentially more importantly, video games look like this. Again, also not exactly a, a spitting image of today's yeah, video games. Now, importantly, there was three co-founders. There was Chris Malachowski, who I probably said his name wrong, apologies, but he was an electrical engineer from Sun Microsystems. There's also Curtis Priam, who was also from Sun, and the most famous of the three, Jensen Wong, who was a director at LSI, and more importantly, a microprocessor designer at AMD. Now, the trio saw a trend in the industry coming of hardware acceleration for things like video and game encoding and that sort of stuff, and so they set up NVIDIA to do just that. The name NVIDIA actually comes from two things. One, they decided that NV, or next version, was their kind of tagline, and so they looked for basically any word with NV in it, and found the Latin word NVIDIA, which is the Latin word for envy, and that's what they picked. Now, their very first product, their very first graphics core, was more like a multimedia encoder, you know, a video card rather than a graphics card, and this was before NVIDIA was putting their name on pretty much anything, and so it was manufactured by a company called SGS Thompson, and they actually named the, the core, the design core name, as SGT2000 after SGS Thompson. Their first actual graphics card, as we kind of know them today, was called the Reva. The Reva 128 was the first model, and this was uh, designed around the Direct3D or DirectX 5 API as well as OpenGL and was designed more specifically for games like Quake 2 to play impressively well for the time. It wasn't long before the Reva TNT came out, which Pardon the pun, was a bit of a, a bombshell card for NVIDIA. It was meant to match the 3DFX Voodoo 2, which was a very popular card at the time, and while its designed clock speed of uh, 110 megahertz would have seen it either match or exceed the Voodoo 2's performance, it was actually ended up being delayed and downclocked to 90 megahertz, which meant it couldn't quite match. What is more important though is that this was the very first time that NVIDIA and actually anyone in the industry came out with a branded driver for their video card. They called it Detonator, obviously sticking with the TNT name, and this was a very impressive driver, especially on AMD CPU systems with their Reva TNT card. Users saw up to 30% more performance at the time thanks to this driver and thanks to their very specific push to having the best drivers available. The TNT2 was an impressive upgrade. I mean, it doubled the amount of memory on the card to 32 megabytes, also doubled the supported uh, texture size of up to 2048 by 2048, and even supported Direct 3D 6 instead of the 5 from the previous generation. But it was outdone not by the Voodoo 3, but by two Voodoo 2s in SLI. Yes, that's right, SLI was not an NVIDIA technology. It was a technology made by 3DFX for their Voodoo style of cards, and it worked really well. The Voodoo cards were over a year old at this point, but if you already had one Voodoo 2, you could throw in a second one and get potentially, or often, better performance and better image quality by using two older and therefore cheaper cards than buying this new TNT2. Now, NVIDIA, ever the competitor, ended up buying 3DFX in 2002 and adopting some of their technologies like SLI for their own graphics cards later on down the line. Now, if there was ever an inflection point for a company like NVIDIA, a point at which you can look back and go, that was just such a significant moment in time 
for them that it just changed the, the entire industry as it was. That point in time was late 1999 when they launched GeForce. Now GeForce is still such a significant brand name that it's still on their very latest cards and that's because it supported a feature called hardware transformation and lighting. That is essentially the thing that turned games from 2D sprites moving around in 3D space to actual 3D models in 3D space. Think Lara Croft Tomb Raider, that kind of 3D models, at least for that kind of time, but it was a very, very important thing to happen. Now, ironically, at the time, it didn't really matter. There weren't many games that supported it, and the few that did generally just used your CPU to do that calculation instead of your graphics card. And people like ATI, who did try and compete by bringing out cards like the ATI Rage Fury Max, which was a dual GPU card that would render alternate frames to try and keep up with the GeForce 256, NVIDIA's first card, uh, that didn't really keep up. Up, and they also suggested that it didn't really matter because uh, as long as you kept your CPU nice and fast, you wouldn't need hardware transformation and lighting on your graphics card itself. Boy, how wrong were they? <laughs> now between 1999 and 2006, Nvidia brought out a lot of different cards for different models and generations and variants, price points, all that sort of stuff. In fact, I want to throw up just the, the sheer list of all of the cards that were there because there was a lot. But importantly, they added some relatively important features. Support for stuff like anti-aliasing, which is removing the jagged edges from the side of objects while rendering, and anastropic filtering as well, which has actually seen a bit of a demise in terms of the feature that's available in games these days, but was pretty important back in, well, 2006 era. Now there's one series in particular I want to highlight here, and actually one card from that series, the 8800 GTX. Now this card launched uh, for, uh, it cost you an arm and a leg, it cost you six or seven hundred dollars to, to buy the card at the time, which was just a, a phenomenal amount of money to be spending on a graphics card at that point, and was actually the same point at which Logan, who you might know from Tech Syndicate, worked for Tiger Direct and was making videos like this one in 4x3 talking about these kinds of cards, which I, I do find funny to, to look back on. Now, with that said, the 800 DCX was a just phenomenal card outright. It could run the original Crisis, as the Can It Run Crisis meme, Yes, it definitely could, and it could even do it at something like 900p, which was a pretty impressive resolution for the time. But then in 2008, the GTX prefix that we all know today, you know, GTX 280, that became a thing with the GTX 280 and 260. Those cards were, again, impressive for the time, although did still cost you an arm and a leg, and offered a decent amount of performance, although this was at the point where Nvidia was significantly gaining market share over ATI and now AMD by that point, and was uh, there were a few worries that Nvidia would start to use their market share position and uh, vast hordes of cash, as Anantech put it, to uh, downplay AMD's successes, let's say. Also in 2008, they acquired a company called Aegea, who was best known for making Physex. And when I say making Physex, a company called Novadex did that, but when Aegea bought them, they acquired Physex and rebranded it to their own, and then when Nvidia bought Aegea, they rebranded it to their own again. With that said, if you don't know what Physex is, it was essentially a physics engine with a hardware acceleration aspect, so your graphics card would do all of that physics processing, offloading it from your CPU so you could get better frame rates and more realistic water, cloth, and ragdoll simulations. Now, game developers had to specifically implement these features. It was effectively a closed platform solution. And while the games that did support it, of which there were only relatively few, while they did support it, you could also run it on your CPU for a bit of a reduced frame rate. And it also generally didn't matter all that much if you turned those things off. It was only advanced cloth or you know, water simulation, stuff that didn't affect gameplay all that much. And so it kind of sounds familiar, right? Now going back to their graphics cards, there's another series I want to highlight, the, the GTX 5 series, specifically the 580, which was well known for running hotter than the surface of the sun, 
and also pretty impressively in what was a bit of a fad for the time was running multiple GPUs in SLI and when I say multiple I mean up to four. Now you had to have games that supported SLI which again was a feature that the game developers had to manually implement and so not all that many games actually supported it but for the games that did you got some impressive performance although realistically it didn't give you 4x the performance it normally gave you somewhere like 1.5 per card so yeah but it was still interesting enough and a very weird image to see pcs that were absolutely stacked full of graphics cards there was also some more modern cards like the gtx 980 and the incredibly popular gtx 970 which offered amazing performance and a not so insane price tag to go with it it even had four gigabytes of vram actually no that's a lie it had 3.5 gigabytes of vram and the extra 500 megs that was technically on the card was 80% slower than the rest of the VRAM, which was the topic of a class action lawsuit for which Nvidia settled for an undisclosed figure. Now, back in 2016, when this lawsuit happened, you could claim up to $30 per graphics card that you'd bought, which again, must have cost Nvidia a pretty penny, but I don't think that figure was ever actually disclosed. And then in 2018, they launched RTX. Now there's actually two sides to RTX. There is the graphics cards themselves, the 2060, 2017, 2080, as well as 2080 Ti and now Super cards. It's a bit complicated. I've got some videos. I'll try and remember to leave them up there if you want to check out the naming scheme stuff. But there's the cards and then there's also the suite of features that the cards can run. Now specifically, this was ray traced lighting and reflections in games, as well as also deep learning super sampling, a way of doing anti-aliasing uh, with effectively AI support to make it a bit better and a few other features that are in there too. Now this was slightly different to PhysX as this was made uh, in partnership with Microsoft and their DirectX ray tracing API which means that in theory anyone can use it, anyone can build hardware for it. The only difference is Nvidia was first to the punch and in theory they'll have a slight advantage as they you know help design it. Now Nvidia doesn't just do consumer graphics cards, they offer what are called quadros which are either server graphics cards or graphics cards for workstations with enhanced uh, floating point precision, other features that can be useful for workstations and a specific driver set for those cards too and also server chips called Teslas not to be infused with the cars or Nikola Tesla uh, which again are incredibly impressive machines and are now coming in even uh, Nvidia branded servers like their DGX1 which while well, does use an Intel CPU or a couple does have a boatload of Nvidia Tesla cards or graphics cards built into it. They also do AI accelerated self-driving car tech at the moment which they actually have a full series on and they also do a system on chips so a CPU and a GPU all on one chip for things like the Nintendo Switch. So that is a, a brief look at Nvidia, some of their products, some of their controversies and some of uh, their kind of key moments I suppose. Now I don't know everything by a good margin and if there's something that I specifically missed here that you know about Nvidia and you'd like people who are watching this to know do leave it in the comments down below so that we can all learn a bit more. With that said, if you like this video and want to see more like it, do hit that subscribe button. And if you want to support the channel in more ways than just watching these videos, then you can take a look at the links in the description down below. I'm going to leave a link to a couple of Nvidia graphics cards if you want to check them out. Uh, those will be Amazon affiliate links that will take you to your local Amazon store where you can see pricing when and where you watch this. There's also Overclockers UK link down there, as well as merch for hoodies or t-shirts like this one if you want a load of cool new designs, including uh, what a essentially looks like an NVIDIA RTX 2060 on your t-shirt. You can pick one of those up too. And there's also a lot of other stuff down there. Uh, stuff like Streamlabs OES if you want to start streaming. Humble Bundle for cheap games and support charities too. And a lot of other stuff. You can also check out some more videos over there including the AMD catch up episode if you want to know more about AMD. And if you have any questions or uh, thoughts about this video, do leave those in the comments down below as well. 
otherwise that is pretty much it thank you for watching hope you enjoyed it and we'll see you all in the next video